uh, I'm not an academicist, though I work for a think tank some time ago, but I learned to, to do things after thinking, because before we were doing things without thinking. So uh, basically, I wanted to, to treat or to deal this issue from the humanitarian perspective, which has been traditionally one of the most sacred areas for the aid sector. When I say sacred, I say, I mean that uh, nobody ever uh, dared to uh, say or to think about that uh, humanitarian action, so the provision of essential rights to the people affected by severe crisis, that could have been part of the field of private corporations of, or business. That was in the sacred core of aid, of aid business. Um, what is interesting is to note, and a little bit of perspective, is that now we are heading the World Humanitarian Summit that will take place in Istanbul in 2016, which is trying to take the things a little bit upside down, not radically, but yes, in the sense of trying to rethink how do we deal with the with huge challenges that we are facing, not only the global aid, but specifically also in the humanitarian aid. Challenges such as the dimension of the crisis we are facing, uh, last year, the overall investment in return action was about $25 billion, which has been an increase of 300% in the last five years. That is a bit of a scary uh, for everybody. Also, the complexity. We are not dealing any longer just with severe crises in the structured states, in societies which are completely upside down, or uh, huge disasters which are taking place uh, far away from the developed world. No, we're talking also about uh, crises which are taking place in middle-income countries with very well-structured societies. Also, the impact of crises which are also being felt in countries which are uh, middle-income, even high-income countries. And um, also a hard complexity which is that, and I quote here um, what MSF is calling or calling our attention mainly, is that where is everyone? We don't have enough partners to work in those crises. There is a lack of capacities, operational capacities on the ground. And then also the positive side, um, opportunities. There are already a lot of playgrounds which are offering us massive opportunities to incorporate modus operandi, ways of doing action, humanitarian action, incorporating not only technologies, and I share absolutely what Ken was saying, it's not only an issue of high in, having high tech, we have now the monograms, the Western units of the world doing something that our colleagues from the DFID are boosting very much, and that we welcome very much, is shifting from food aid to food assistance, which implies giving cash to people, as we are doing in Spain with the people which are unemployed. We don't give them a ration. For that, there are some NGOs doing and complementing what we cannot reach from the state. But there are cards, credit cards, I have mine with no credit, but we have cards which are used by the, the, the citizens, I resist to call them beneficiaries, the citizens which are entitled to get access to food, to school, to shelter, to health, to education. So this, this way of doing things, which is changing very much now, and is getting massively and massively more important, uh, is much more efficient and effective, doing it by some partners which are not, and I'm sorry if the WFP is around here, one of my beloved partners, the World Food Program, but it's not by distributing boxes or sacks is by distributing credit cards that can be implemented then and then used in the cash uh, withdrawers or even the, in, the, in the shops. This is not anywhere, but this is getting more and more. And just an example, the Sahel, which is one of the most deprived regions, is already having, on above all, 11 million persons affected by a severe uh, drought and a food, food crisis. 60% are receiving food in kind, and 40% in the most deprived region of the world, they're receiving food in cash, in money. Also, another example which uh, can, we can also draw attention, and we have been studying this together with the ITD, Ericsson, and I think we can do commercials because they're doing it very well. So Ericsson or DHL, they are doing, they're providing fantastic services on ITC or on logistics, and something that I think has been mentioned before, but which is very much linked with the next thing that I want to say, which is the 
OCHA and World Economic Forum principles for private-public collaboration in humanitarian action, which is they are delivering from the core of the business. They are not doing uh, uh, marketing or well-perceived actions. No, they are simply supplying what they know what to do. Ericsson, they are supplying uh, capacities to upgrade uh, in uh, telecom, telecom, telecommunications upgrade in situations of disaster. Mm, DHL is doing the same, facilitating the handling and the organization of airports. Uh, in a case like Nepal, that was key to the block, the, the aid. But also, both of them, they're working in enabling potential partners, so authorities or companies which are on the countries, on the vulnerable countries, to be prepared for the next crisis because they are going to come. So new players, and again I quote the World Humanitarian Summit, are more than welcome. New players, they are not only corporations, but they are two new players. They are not new, but we are perceiving them like new. And here again I will say something that if there is any humanitarian around will kill me. Uh, I can say it because I'm humanitarian from 20 years ago, so I have the benefit of, of, of being an old chap. Um, the humanitarian players are not any longer, uh, let's say, a club. We need players who do humanitarian action. And in that sense, we include, and I will say again, a scene, a big scene, corporations, armed forces, public services, not any way and not any how and not any when. I don't know if this is an English expression. Not always they are going to be welcome, not always they're going to be the license to operate, not always they're going to have clear humanitarian objectives, and they are going to behave on the, under the humanitarian principles. If they do so, then they are more than welcome. And I will put an example. Last year, Ebola, West Africa, what was most needed? Uh, armed forces, which are the only ones who have these units to provide safe places to operate with NBQ, I don't know, nuclear, uh, chemical, and, and uh, biological uh, protection. They were more than welcome, and they were not there, many of them. This is an example. Another example is what I was mentioning before uh, with Ericsson or others. There is a framework already which is enabling us to engage these new players. This global compact that was mentioned before, the OCHA uh, economic uh, forum uh, principles, which are going to uh, trying to extract this engagement from the corporations, uh, so based on the core competences, needs driven, having a clear separation between business and humanitarian aid, and this is a clear issue that also is very much compatible with business. You can do humanitarian action, and at the same time, by doing that, learn, expand your competences, and then applicate them to your market. You are not going to sell your products probably to those kind of populations, to these kind of, of clients, but you can draw all of those experiences and, and, and capacities for expanding them, your business, or doing uh, uh, an and also, other issue that I think is very much integrated into some of the corporations. Last week, I was in, in the, in the COSOC, and we had a meeting, interesting meeting with um, some corporations. One of them was uh, Acer Lor Mittal. And it was clear, they were very much engaged in the Ebola crisis response. One of the questions that I made them, and they responded clearly, is they wanted to work in Liberia because they wanted to maintain business continuation. They wanted to get license or to reinforce their license to operate in Liberia. Is that against the humanitarian principles? Not by definition. If there is a clear difference on what they were providing and if they were doing it under certain principles, if that benefits them to maintain their business in Liberia, accomplishing the global compact and all of those uh, uh, essential ethical uh, uh, references, they are more than welcome. There's one issue that I wanted also to point out regarding the relationship that we can have, and here I start to enter into the role of the, of the public administration, which is that we have been witnessing several times uh, that still we have a lot of univocal relationship. So the public administration provides resources for the pr public, uh, private sector to deliver. That's fair whenever that is competitive and whenever you don't find those resources or whenever those resources are more effic efficient and, and, and effective. But it's too poor. I think that we're talking about partnership. We're trying to see a more be univocal 
relationship. And in that sense, I would like to put the example of uh, an experience that we are supporting through the ATD, but also with uh, Acciona, Iberdrola, and uh, Philips, plus the UNHCR, which is an experience, and I see Julio here, not exempt from a lot of pain and sweat, but, uh, and that, that goes to what Ken was saying, is not easy to do partnerships, but it's essential to do partnerships. We cannot not do uh, partnerships. So the thing is that these experiences, just to show you some figures, which are very brutal, but they, they, are, they speak by themselves. The Spanish Corporation has invested 160,000 euro, a seed fund, in order to promote an innovation program on energy delivery in the refugee camps in Shire, in the north of Ethiopia. Um, the investment, I think a bit underestimated, but they have been very shy, but the investment provided already by the companies is equal to that investment, and probably by the end of the program is going to be much bigger than these investments. We are not providing resources to the companies to do that job. They're doing it because they have the, their different and genuine interest, but they're doing it under a framework of principles and modus operandi which are absolutely respectful with humanitarian aid. Together with those players which are specifically humanitarian, or they have the, the humanitarianism in through the core business, and also providing the resources they have. Human resources, technology, even, even in-kind material. Then something that I wanted to go for, what are the challenges and what are we having as, as you know, the, the, the role of the, of the uh, public administration. In the Spanish cooperation, we have integrated the uh, PPPs, still three, we'll include the fourth. The PPPs in the fourth master plan, uh, which is going from 13 to 2016. 17, sorry. Uh, it is one of the aims. We have also an economic growth strategy, which is already trying to incorporate, from 2007 already, trying to incorporate the role of the private corporations, not only big ones, but also the enhancing of the, of the private corporations in, in developing countries. But anyway, we find ourselves as a promoter, as a facilitator, I don't know how long, two minutes, uh, facilitator of those processes where different players have a lot of things in, a lot of interests probably in common, that perhaps many of them they didn't still uh, are, are aware that, that they are, and also a lot of complementarities. So this kind of promoter, sometimes instigator, with seed funds, with ideas, but also interconnectivity, we think is a role that the public administration must, must uh, uh, implement. In that sense, there are players, international organizations, NGOs that we deal with. There are local organizations that we deal with or that our partners deal with, but also the corporations that have a lot of potentiality and we need to provide this platform. And here's one of the challenges. We don't have a lot of experience in providing those platforms. We're learning by doing. We don't have a rational Cartesian approach we are learning by doing. So I think that this is one of the things that we need really to incorporate, and there are already two uh, things to, to, to like, like, I mean, like main ideas. One, we need, and I fully agree with what was said before, we need to take risks. We need to, to throw ourselves into the swimming pool and to start to go into some experiences to learn and to expand. Knowing that they are difficult, knowing that we are going to have failures, knowing that we have also the capacity to learn from there. Also very important to, and here I take advantage to, to thank also Lida with uh, Maria, her colleague, uh, to provide external objective analysis on how we are doing and in what, what things we are failing. Because one of the major problems or the major challenges that we are facing, I think, is that still, though we have a lot of text and we have a lot of rationale, there is still a very different culture of doing things and of approaching the same problems from the different stakeholders. And this is a, is a massive challenge. So sessions like this, and I really feel very proud to have here filled people from the Spanish Cooperation Agency and probably many other uh, uh, members of uh, implementing partners engaging into these kind of settings or other settings, even smaller, to try to open the mind and to see how potential, big potential and how we can engage with these, uh, these uh, new deals. And then last but not least, 
uh, definitely another big challenge that I think we are facing is that we don't have still, and here I say our culpa, we still don't have the good tools to promote all of those initiatives. We need really to upgrade those tools. We need to provide also probably more resources, uh, but already by having better adapted contracting, administrative, and even legal frameworks, that would help a lot to uh, just to facilitate this bubbling issue which is coming up. So I would stop here and I will be very happy to deal with questions that will be directed to Ken.